All right. Up next, we have Keith Wilson from Cyber Reason. He's one of the senior sales engineers over there. He's going to be talking to you about money. Thanks for coming out, guys. Um, my name is Keith Wilson, Senior Sales Engineer with uh, Cyber Reason. I'm not going to get product specific in this talk at all, though. Um, I've been a sales engineer for about the last four or five years. I've worked in information security for about the last 12, 13 years. Um, my time as a sales engineer has given me the opportunity to speak with a lot of customers. And what I've seen continually is budgets getting slashed or just not being approved. And, uh, overall in, in security. So I kind of wanted to speak on some things you can do when your budget gets hit um, or if you're not given one at all. Um, I will talk about open source software a little bit in here, uh, but not much. This isn't going to be a super technical talk. Uh, it's going to be high level, but uh, there's still some, I think, some good important takeaways from this. So when I look at today's information security landscape, I'm reminded a bit of the Battle of Thermopylae. Uh, so if you aren't familiar with the Battle of Thermopylae, this was where roughly 300 Spartan soldiers held off hundreds of thousands of Persian invaders, including the famed Persian immortals. The 300 Spartans were the cyber poor. They didn't have resources that the rest of the Greek military had, yet they were able to use what they had to hold off the Persians and eventually allow the Athenians to win. And one of the keys to the Spartans' victory had to do with their culture. They were highly focused on training to be a warrior. It's what they lived every day. When your funds have been cut or never existed to begin with, you have to be a cybersecurity warrior. You have to live your work life focused on defeating the enemy. And in the Battle of Thermopylae, the Persians were the enemy, at least from the Greek point of view. In our day-to-day -day work battles, attackers, office politics, and budgets are our enemies. So let's go ahead and make the distinction up front uh, between the cyber rich and the cyber poor. And I'm not using these terms to pit groups against each other or be derogatory towards one group or another. It's just the fact that the global 2000 federal governments can afford more security tools. They can afford to have larger headcount. Uh, they can pay more, so they tend to attract uh, uh, more candidates. Um, but there's hundreds of thousands of other companies out there that can't do that. So. Even their budgets, even the larger companies and governments, even their budgets get slashed since information security is looked at more as an insurance policy and a cost center than anything else. And it's important to recognize that cyber po poverty exists and it's a problem. And it's not just a problem for the businesses that can't afford the best security tools. It's a problem for the consumers of their products. And that consumer may be even a company that's, a, that's part of the cyber rich. Now, in the Battle of Thermopylae, the gap in the Spartan defense was a trail that allowed the Persians to flank them. And this trail was revealed to Xerxes, the Persian king, by a former Spartan. Now, if you're one of the cyber rich, that's great. Money can help solve a lot of problems. However, I'm sure you work with plenty of outsourced vendors that are cyber poor. And this creates a gap in your security program. Customer information is held by a lot of these companies. And they are easy targets for attackers. Attackers realize that it's much easier to subvert security systems of smaller companies than larger companies. And also, before an attack takes place on a larger company, a big target, where do you think the attackers practice? They practice, if you're going to attack Bank of America or Wells Fargo, you're going to start with a smaller regional bank first. Now, that doesn't mean larger companies can relax. They're still the whales for the attackers. Where smaller businesses, including the mom and pop shops, they're more of the lower hanging fruit. So what can be done about this problem? It's not something that can be solved individually. It's not even something that can be solved at the individual company level. When the Spartans fought the Persians, they were doing it so that the Athenians and the rest of Greece had time to prepare for battle. This was a group effort, and at that time, many of the Greek city-states were not united. However, there were plenty that realized they had a common enemy in the Persians. And it was that common enemy that helped them to defend themselves from the invasion. So what can we do? 
We have to start working as a security community and sharing stories and data, not just disclosing data after a breach. We can look to different open source software to help fill in our gaps in security. Now, this isn't going to be the silver bullet fix, though. This is just the Spartans holding off the Persians. There are pros and cons to using open source software, and we'll take a look at this in a little bit. We can also invest, we can also invest more time in training and learning to mature the craft of information security. And I know it can be difficult to find the time to train, but if you want to be a modern day Spartan, you need to hone your skills. Now, the Spartans trained, complete, uh, trained constantly to be warriors. This was ingrained in them since childhood. They made the time to train, and it paid off in their ability to use less resources and still remain a strong defense. We need to take a look at how we spend our time during the day. Are we doing things as efficiently as possible? For organizations that can't afford to hire a large staff for information security, we need to make sure that we've budgeted our time and are using the tools that we do have to save us time and not create more work. Also, we need to, we need to make sure that the processes that we're using are documented. And again, I, can, I understand that this can eat into time that you've already have so little of, but sometimes we need to spend the time up front to save us time in the future. Having a documented process not only makes sure that your knowledge can be passed along to others, but that you can refer to the process when you have so much on your mind that you kind of get lost in what you're doing, you don't know what to do next. And having a baseline process will also allow you to tweak that process over time so that you can find efficiencies and improve upon them where possible. And this will also help with my next point, which is documenting return on investment. This is what the people who cut the checks will understand. You know, how much money are you saving them? And this could be in money or it could be in time. And how much, how much risk are you actually reducing for them? So show the actual value with facts and it'll be much easier for them to loosen up the grip on the wallet. Now I understand that this will be a large undertaking for many of you and it won't happen overnight. So try to learn to enjoy the process of doing this. And that way you can say that you've built something. You know, you have that on your resume. I built the security program. I saved X amount of money. I was able to cut, cut, uh, keep headcount at X amount. Um, and that, that looks really good to managers, directors, VPs when you're shopping around. Okay, so let's start with open source software. I'm definitely not an open source expert, so I'm just going to talk about some of the software that's a bit more popular. Um, if we want to look at that software from a Spartan perspective, this is the pass between the sea and the mountain range that made it too narrow for the Persians to send all of their forces at once. Uh, this was a tool that they used to their advantage. It was free. It cost them nothing but the knowledge of the landscape. Let's talk about some of the upsides of open source software. The biggest one is that it's free. Another is that it's monitored by a community of security experts. Uh, the people that use the tools day in, day out. And a lot of these experts even contribute to the code. The downside is the lack of support. But this can be supplemented with professional services from a partner. And we're going to talk uh, more about leveraging partners and vendor relationships later in the talk. Uh, but for now, just acknowledge that they can provide services to help support open source software. So another potential downside is that the code is open to another level of security experts. And unfortunately, these experts are the people you're trying to defend against. Having exposed code allows these attackers to find zero day exploits easier. Um, and so we can, we can work around this by utilizing layers of open source software to fill in the gaps between the commercial products. And I wouldn't recommend having a completely open source security tool program, um, but instead supplementing it within areas of your network that you can't afford to cover with commercial software. Okay, let's start with some of the tried and true open source security tools. Uh, these will probably be known to most of you. But I still think it's important to call them out for those that might be newer to the industry or might not have had the time to look into them. So Snort. Snort's an open source intrusion detection and prevention system. It's been around for almost two decades, and there's a full community of people who support it. Uh, there's a language uh, for writing Snort rules so that rules can be shared throughout that community. ClamAV. ClamAV is an open source antivirus engine. It's currently maintained by Cisco's Talos uh, Threat Research Group. Uh, it works on almost all platforms. Come back. Come back. Uh, 
Maybe. Almost. All right, so Claim AV, open source antivirus engine maintained by Cisco Talos uh, Threat Research Group, works on almost all platforms like Snort. It's also been around for quite a while. Uh, Cuckoo Sandbox provides sandboxing and malware analysis. It's community supported and maintained by a team that donates their time. The Elk stack is actually three separate open source products that provide an open source log server. It consists of Kibana, uh, which is the user interface, Elasticsearch, which is the distributed search piece and analytics engine, and Logstash, which is the data collection piece of the stack. If you're looking for an open source vulnerability scanner, there's OpenVAS or OpenVAS. Um, many commercial vulnerability scanning uh, companies also offer f a freeware version of their products, but you need to make sure that you read the license to know if you can actually use the scanner in, your, in a business setting. Um, open source security tools aren't just limited to defense. Actually, most of them are offensive security tools uh, used for testing your network. Metasploit is an exploitation framework. The framework itself is open. However, the interfaces for it are not all open source. The framework is owned and supported by Rapid7. They offer a community edition of the interface, which is free. Uh, and then there's Armitage, which is a free and open source GUI tool for the Metasploit framework. If you're trying to raise awareness uh, around phishing and spear phishing attacks, the Social Engineer Toolkit makes creating these and running these attacks easier than it should be. I actually, um, at a previous company, I worked with the inside sales team because I wanted to see how easy it was. So I, I walk them through creating an, uh, creating an attack, so creating a, a phishing email and sending it out, and uh, did it in a lab environment. I, I walked them through the steps, same steps that you could find on, on a Google search. And the longest it took any of them, these are not technical people at all, longest it took any of them was five minutes to, to compromise another system. So the important thing to keep in mind when you're looking into open source software, um, of any sort is there's going to be a time trade-off uh, in implementation support and they really are just a tool they still aren't much use to you and your team if you don't have the knowledge and time to use them properly so the spartans were really the only group in ancient greece that were professional warriors all of the other city-states used people that had uh, that weren't soldiers by trade uh, they were farmers and artisans that would fight in the military only when it was needed they didn't train, and so they didn't have the skills that the Spartans had. And training was probably the biggest thing that made the Spartans so formidable. They took the time to learn and refine their craft, and this is what made them the infamous warriors that they were. Now, in the same sense, you should take the time to train in your craft. I know that we all have time and budget constraints, but the time and money you invest in training will pay off. Continued learning is important for a few reasons. So stagnation leads to boredom and inefficient work. Stagnation and boredom are career killers, and for the managers in the room, they will drive your people away. Keeping your team trained will keep them happy, and you'll have a higher rate, they'll have a higher rate of job satisfaction. I know that most of the analysts I talk to love to learn new things. Um, the hard part goes back to the time and money problem. So to get around the issue of money, um, look into things like cross-training, users groups, and virtual training. Uh, Cross-training, that'll help, that'll also help with the time problem. So if you've trained someone enough to do the very basics of your job, you'll be able to dedicate more time to training or other tasks that you need to do that are a little bit more complicated and detailed. Uh, Cross-training will also help to create empathy between employees and departments. It can even give you insight into different security weaknesses within your organization by taking the time to see the workflow of others. Now, local user groups, they're a great way to get some product-specific training, uh, especially if it's a vendor-run user group. Um, they're also a good way to interact with your peers and share challenges and ex experiences. If it is a vendor-run user group, make sure that they are providing more than just food and alcohol. I mean, that's always nice. Uh, but it's going to be hard to justify you taking a day off to go to a user group if you come back and just say, well, yeah, I just ate and drank all day. Um, 
Now, make sure that the, if, if you do go to a vendor one, make sure that they're giving you product specific information, that they're answering the questions that you have, and that they're facilitating conversations between you and your peers. Now, virtual training is a good option for the organizations that can spare some budget for formal training. Now, virtual instructors uh, led training is usually cheaper than in person training, and it can be done from anywhere. My suggestion is to make sure you do the training wherever you normally do your work. Don't take the training from your couch or bed at home because you will find other distractions and that money and time invested will be lost on you. It's going to be important that you're able to justify and show your employer why you just spent the money and took that time to train. And not paying attention can help guarantee that you'll get less or no training in the future. Making sure that you go to quality training that is also the right training will help make sure that the time, travel, and monetary investments you are making are, are good ones. So a stock trader doesn't just pick a random stock and then throw tons of money at it. They research the stock to determine if it's worth their investment. And you should research, you should do the same with training. You should research ahead of time. So with budget, time, and travel all being considerations, your ability to justify the expense of all three of these will be important to getting future training. And that justification starts with researching the training ahead of time. But before researching, we might want to identify some metrics that we can use. And these metrics are going to vary, but we can look at some questions that might help you determine those metrics for your specific situation. So what skills are gained from the training? Will those skills increase efficiency? Will those skills make you better at your job? Will those skills help with future products and plans for your organization? What's the expected impact to your job performance? How will this training save future time and money? And what will your return on investment be in both time and money? When you're considering registering for training, you want to have some questions in mind to help determine if this training is right for you. Some of those questions might look like, who are the instructors? Do they have a good reputation? Are they known for being able to convey information easily and effectively, or do they put their audiences to sleep? And it's funny, I actually rehearsed this talk last night with my uh, my wife, and I, I got home late, so I forced her. She's not a computer person at all, and it's already late. So I forced her to sit through this, and I got to this part and looked over, and she was sleeping on the couch. So what do others say about this course? Are you able to find any reviews online uh, that discuss the instructor and the course itself? Do other people that have taken the course, whether you work with them, you interact with them in, in user groups or locally, did they find what they've learned valuable? What was their return on investment? And does the course line up with any certifications? If the outcome of the course is to have you ready to be certified, how will this apply to your job or your personal brand? And are they teaching just for the certification, or is it going to be information you can actually put into practice as well? What are the sources used for creating the training content? Where are the course developers getting their information from? If it's from experience, what does that experience, what does the experience of that course developer look like? Um, and unfortunately, experience can just lead to anecdotal evidence sometimes. And this isn't always the case, but it's something to keep in mind. Now, there's always going to be a time problem. I know that all of you already have a busy enough schedule, but taking the time to train can help you be more efficient at what you do. It can help, it can help save future time. Think of it as making an upfront investment in time, kind of like taking the time to do a proper setup and documentation of your security tools. If you still aren't convinced that you have time, please just put that aside for one course. Take one course, come back, and see what you actually missed. I'm sure the company will still be running. Most cases, the building will still be standing. A lot of people complain about not having enough time for their job. I believe that for the most part, this is true, but I also think a lot of it has to do with inefficiencies. People either spend too much time on the wrong thing, or they get sidetracked down rabbit holes. If you really want to know where your inefficiencies lie, you're going to have to be honest with yourself. You'll have to determine where your strengths and weaknesses are. So make a list of these if it helps. Focus on doing your strengths and improving or delegating your weaknesses. Monitor the amount of time that you are spending on different tasks. Stopwatch it or use software if necessary to track your time throughout the, your day-to-day -day tasks. Do this for a few days, then review the information you've collected. I know it feels a little odd to be talking about workflow and 
finding ways to improve your efficiencies at a security conference, but I feel like this can help towards reclaiming time and help the security industry as a whole. Because when you're working on in an understaffed role, because your organization can't afford to staff more people, time becomes very important. That's why we're going to divert here for a minute and talk about finding workflows and ways to become efficient. I strive to be super efficient because I understand how valuable time can be. For my job, I do a lot of travel. I was just in Florida um, yesterday morning. I woke up at 3 o'clock this morning to get here, flying back home tonight, uh, and I'll be in Maryland next week and then Nashville the week after that. So I do a lot of travel. Um, and when I am home, I'm often working. So I do have a wife and two young children that do need me to be present, though. And this is why I value my time. This is why I try to use the most of it and get things done as efficiently as possible. So here are a few things that I do to help reclaim my time. First, I want to dismiss the notion of multitasking. No one can multitask well. If you want to do something well, you can't have your focus split or diverted. Doing something well requires 100% focus, and trying to split your attention only leads to mistakes and forgetting pieces of that task that you're working on. So while you're working, let's focus on one thing at a time. I know it might sound counterintuitive, but it works. I can do five things at a time poorly or slowly, or poorly and slowly, uh, because I'm always trying to remember where I am with certain tasks. Or I can pick one thing, do the work with 100% focus, and then move on to the next task with speed and intent. If I can suggest that you read or listen to one book on workflow and efficiencies, I would suggest Getting Things Done by David Allen. Uh, this will give you an overall framework for getting through work and doing the work you do well. Uh, there's a website that's a bit of a uh, companion to this. I don't believe that it was created by the author, but it helps put his framework in action in a technological way. And the website is thesecretweapon.org. Using the Getting Things Done framework in this way may not be for everyone, or you may have to modify it a bit. Uh, I've used a modified version of this over the years. Um, I've added things to it. I've taken away from it, but I, I kind of have my own system now. And it's really helped to improve my workflow. I used to spend too much of my time trying to remember specifics about a task or trying to remember what, uh, what task to do next. Um, this helped with that, and it helped me to make sure that things weren't forgotten. Another book that helped with my workflow was called Eat That Frog. And you can read it if you want, but I'll summarize it. Do the things you want to do least first. This speech is a great example of that. I love doing these talks, but planning for them can be extremely tedious. Writing, editing, slide design, rehearsing. There's a lot of work that's put into, into this for just a 30, uh, 40 minute presentation. And I hate doing most of it. And that's why every morning I start my work day, or I started when I was developing this, I would start my work day by developing this presentation. Something else that I do when I'm performing a task that has the opportunity to monopolize my day, but it shouldn't, is to time box it. So by that I mean I'll set a timer and do the task until that timer goes off. As I was writing out this talk, I would set a timer for 20, 30, uh, 20 to 30 minutes each morning and then I would write for that amount of time. I just keep writing until the timer went off. Once the timer went off, I put it away, I moved on to the next task. And it kept this specific task from consuming more of my workday than I could afford. Also, make a plan daily. Determine what your day will look like by prioritizing tasks. You can do this by determining which tasks are urgent, which tasks are important, and which tasks you want to do the least. Looking at a task from these angles should help you decide when, you're, when in your day you should perform it. Now, I don't want to spend much more time on workflow and being efficient, but I will share one last tip with you before we move on. Start your day with something that inspires or motivates you. Now, despite how it may look, I go to the gym almost every morning. This requires me getting up a little bit earlier than I would like, uh, but it allows me to work out for about an hour to an hour and a half each day. And I found that working out gets me pumped up for the rest of the day ahead. It could be the actual workout, the music I listen to, the 350 milligrams of caffeine that's in my uh, pre-workout, or a combination of all of them. But I've noticed that when I start the day doing something that motivates me, I can push through the work and hustle much faster than I could otherwise. So now we're going to move on to documentation setting up your security process. Now, you could document 
any way that you're feeling comfortable. This could be video, could be writing, could be recording audio, whatever works best for you. Don't worry about being formal when you first start documenting what you're doing. Uh, just work on getting the information out of your head. Once it's out, you can clean it up and format it properly for others to consume. I personally like video. I like being able to answer questions with a link to a video. However, not everyone consumes information as easily through video. So when the time permits, I like to go back and put it into other formats. The upside of doing video too is usually you can extract the audio from that. So you have two formats covered in one and then you go back and just transcribe it. So when you're starting or restarting to build out your information security program, you'll want to look at what resources you already have. Evaluate if you're getting what you should from those resources in terms of time savings and intelligence gathering. Determine if the tools you have in place are really providing value or if they're just another tool that no one's using or even worse is wasting the time of the people using them. This whole process is going to require a lot of honesty, honesty with yourself and honesty with those on your team. If the tool's useless, stop using it. Get rid of it. If you think that the tool is useless now, but with a bit more tuning or configuration, it could really help, then salvage it by dedicating some uh, time or professional services dollars towards improving it. Now again, this takes real honesty. Don't throw good money after bad to try and fix poor decisions or save face. This can save money in terms of resource utilization, licensing or maintenance fees, uh, or time spent not only using the tool, but maintaining it. I know it can be hard to admit that an idea someone had at one point is no longer good. It might have been good and useful at the time, but businesses evolve and so do the people within those businesses. Once you've already evaluated what you have at your disposal, identify gaps. By the way, you should be documenting all of this. You'll need it to justify changes. You'll need it to explain risk. You'll need it to explain ROI. You'll need it for cross training and onboarding. Don't let these things take up space in your head. Get them on, get them on paper, video, audio, again, whatever is the easiest for you to get it out of your head. Next, evaluate the tools, people, or processes that can fill these gaps. Can some of the tools you already have in place cover some of those gaps with a bit of tweaking? If you aren't sure or don't have the time to figure it out, ask your vendor. A good vendor should be more than willing to help you find solutions to your problems with tools that they sold you. Or worst case scenario, they'll point you in the direction of another tool that could fill that gap. Is there someone in your organization that's being underutilized? Is there a way that you could help, that they could help you manually cover that gap until a tool can be put in place? If so, make sure that you document how much it costs that company to manually have that person doing the job because it'll help justify a tool purchase down the road. Next, we can look at process. Will a simple change to process help to cover an existing gap? Sometimes organizations are bloated or misguided with process, and getting a process or policy removed or changed may be the easiest and cheapest way to help cover those gaps. Some things you want to keep in mind as you begin to build or rebuild your security program are, what are your company's goals? you'll have to align your goals and mission with this. What is the mission of your security operations team? Make your mission short and clear. It's something you'll want to reference in every decision you make. Then document. Again, I can't stress this enough. When I first began at my previous company, I was chosen to lead all of the pre and post sales technical support. I started by writing what I called the customer success manifesto. I didn't get into the weeds by being super detailed with it, at least until the end of the document. I wanted to get my general ideas and beliefs down on paper first, and I made sure that every line of the document related back to the mission. Then I shared it with the rest of the department heads to get their thoughts and input as well. This is the document that I could easily refer back to for myself if I forgot where I initially wanted us to head, but it's also something that I could uh, point new hires to when they were onboarding. I can't tell you the precise ways and tactics of building your security program since each of you are going to have different needs and a different mission. I can only give these general guidelines, but I will share my contact information at the end of this and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have on your specific needs. Now, working in sales for several years now, I've noticed that most security analysts 
have a hard time relaying the value of a tool in business terms, and it's for good reason too. It's probably not something you were taught in school, and it's not something you do in your day-to-day -day job, and even more importantly, it's probably something you really don't even care about. But it's something that you should care about, and here's why. The people that cut the checks for that cool new tool you want to get, it's all they care about. They only think in terms of return on investment and reduction of risk. When you're testing out or doing a proof of concept on a new tool that you want to implement in your environment, try thinking of it from the point of view of the people that allocate budget. Of course, this is on top of having to put on your security analyst hat and make sure that the tool actually does what you need it to do. Make sure that you're documenting. Lost it again. Make sure that you're documenting what you weren't able to do without the tool. How many events were you seeing? How many of those were false positives? How much time did you or your team have to spend on investigating those events? Remember that return on investment can come in time saved. Because the more time that you can save, the less your department needs to spend on headcount. And this is a measurable thing that you can present to leadership. Uh, my good friend, he's also the CTO of, a uh, yes sir. All right, let's do this again. So my good friend, he's the CTO of a newer startup called Witfu, uh, Charles Herring. He gave a talk uh, that goes much more in depth in documenting this uh, when he spoke here in 2015. The video is still up. I just watched it uh, earlier today. Um, you may remember it as the boring flowchart talk, but it walked through the procedures of properly documenting and justifying the expense of not only tools, but headcount. So here's a big way to save time and money that not many people talk about, but it's vendor utilization. I've worked on the vendor side for most of my career in security, um, and it's given me the opportunity to see lots of environments and work closely with different personality types in security. Best of all, it's given me the opportunity to actually help many different security teams all over the country. This help isn't always just selling them a new tool or helping them troubleshoot a tool that they've already purchased. I've actually w stopped meetings and told customers to buy the competition because it was a better fit. I like to think of myself as more of a consultant to these businesses, and that's the approach that you should be demanding of your vendors. You should be asking them to help fit the security tools that they sold you into the security program that you have. You should be asking them how this tool can reduce, uh, reduce false positives and the time to address issues within your environment. Or is it just going to add more noise and work to maintain and respond to? This doesn't mean that you should ignore uh, a tool just because it's illuminating more of your environment or presenting more to you. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. You should be asking the vendors, how will this reduce the amount of time I have to spend doing certain tasks in a day? If the tool is only adding more time without adding new useful information, it's probably not a good fit. Ask your vendor the amount of time needed to deploy their tools and the amount of time you'll need to spend to maintain them. Don't just take their word for it though. The account management teams at your vendors do have the ulterior motive of making money. Most of us are paid on commission. This isn't a bad thing, but it's only good if they're selling you something that will actually help. Now, during the Persian invasion, the Greeks had to share information with each other. They were all disparate cities, city-states, and most of them didn't even get along. But they had to band together to take on their co common enemy. They did this not just by giving the time and resources of their military, but they shared the information with each other. And information sharing between security teams and other departments and companies allow us as a community of security professionals to become a stronger force. And I understand that there are some hang-ups and legalities around information sharing, so everyone's situation is going to be different. Let's start with where we can share information. Local security groups such as B-Sides, ISSA, and InfraGuard are great forums for sharing information. Uh, this information doesn't necessarily have to be specifics so of a breach on your network, although sharing an anonymized version of those IOCs can definitely be helpful. Uh, these are great places to share thoughts, theories, and processes that have been on your mind or put into practice. Uh, they're, a good, uh, they're good places to get experienced opinion of other security professionals and network with other security professionals. I'm fortunate enough that my talk was selected for this conference because I like to share ideas. Uh, but sometimes I get locked in my own bubble, 
Uh, so this gives me not only the soapbox to share those ideas, but it allows me to have conversations about security. Now, my previous company, I worked with a law enforcement with our law enforcement advisor, who is a longtime LAPD major crimes detective. He and I discussed how, in law enforcement, they share information, and it's not just in ongoing investigations uh, to help find or prosecute suspects, but they also do it to keep each other safe. They call the safety aspect of this pre-incident indicators. So this would be what it would look like if they had a bird's eye view of a suspect that opened fire on police but with a focus on what the person is doing before they started shooting. So what, is, what does that person's body language look like? Where did they move? How did they position themselves? By sharing this information, law enforcement officers can reduce their risk uh, in the future. In IT security, we have the benefit of being able to record all of the pre-indicator activities of an attack. We can also record all of the activities of the attack and the, what happened afterwards. We're able to record all this, so we do have that advantage. So there's a movement uh, in place to help support the sharing of technical security data uh, behind a breach. And this is where we're briefly going to talk about taxi sticks and cybox. And we're going to briefly talk about it because I know very little about these. I just wanted to kind of bring them up so that you guys are aware of them. You can do more research on it. So taxi is a free and open source transport mechanism that standardizes the automated exchange of cyber threat information. What does this mean? So taxi is a set of specifications to deliver threat intelligence. Cybox provides the structure for representing observables. So observables, simply put, they're indicators of compromise. Styx is the language used, to, uh, used in standardizing uh, the shared information. These frameworks provide for an, anonym, uh, an anonymized version of the data that you're sharing, and it uh, enables the ease of sharing with customers, sister corporations, and business partners. So if you're familiar with the Battle of Thermopylae, you know that in the end, the 300 Spartans were eventually defeated by the Persians. But this was after killing thousands of Persian soldiers. But the bigger picture was that Sparta as a whole, and more importantly, Greece, was not conquered by the Persians. Because of the preparation the Spartans made up front with using the most out of what little they had in the way of efficiencies, training, supplementing uh, with the landscape, and communication, they became a huge hindrance to the Persians while at the same time being, becoming infamous. So let's not look at we don't, uh, what we don't have in the way of funding, but what we do have in the way of all the hardworking and intelligent professionals in this room to win our own battles in the cybersecurity war. All right, so this is the part where uh, if you guys have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, if you don't feel like asking me now, I will be at a happy hour or bar after this. My flight doesn't leave until 9 o'clock, so... I will be drinking. Um, and if you don't catch me there, Twitter and Instagram, uh, at Detected Anomaly, and my email address, keep.wilson at cyberreason.com. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs>